was having yours if I just went ahead and composed an email. And at the end of the class, what I'll do is send an email to everybody, every um, person on that list to have this information. Am I allowed to take off my mask up here since I'm like six feet away from y'all? Okay. Um, okay. So um, let, I want to start today by asking you guys, just so I have a good idea of where you are. What are, what is your, what have you been told about what you should be doing when you go on listing presentations, listing appointments? Like any, what did they tell you in real estate class or what have you used with other companies you've been with? I never have been given that information. Just take the required documents. Okay, so you take your forms. Okay, anything else? I didn't hear your question. The, um, I asked, I just want to know where you guys are. So I asked, what in your experience have you been told to do at listing pres presentations or listing appointments? I guess, I guess one of the, the hometown, they kind of showed me a, a sample. And, Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll give you a brief description of what I was told when I first got the mark in the business over 20 years ago. So we were told you're supposed to do a CMA. So, right, yeah. So you're supposed to do a CMA and go prepared to, to share your CMA at the listing appointment. So that is what I did since that's what I'm told to do. What I found was I spent hours and hours on CMAs before I went to the listing. And then when I got there, the house was either a dump and I thought it was a palace or vice versa. So I never could like kind of pull my CMA out because I was either going to offend them because it was too low or I was going to make them believe they could get a whole lot more for their house than they actually could. So over the years, I've, I developed a system says, okay, that's ridiculous. There's no need for me to spend a couple hours on the CMA before I get to the house. It may not even be relevant information. So how do I do this and not do that? The other thing that I was told was, <clears throat> you're supposed to go with some big fancy presentation and be prepared to sit at their kitchen table and talk to them for a couple of hours. And I did that too. And I found myself walking out of listings thinking, you know what, I just I just spent two or three hours with these people while my family was sitting at home waiting for me. And that's not why I'm doing this. So over the years, like I'm about to hand you on a silver platter, what I consider the most valuable piece of business I've developed over 20 years. So, or, or process. And all I ask is that you use it to make as most money as you can. Just don't abuse it in any way. Um, so, I'm going to back up and talk about my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> the outfit is out of trend, if you've noticed. Um, but, make no mistake about it. When you go on a listing appointment, they are buying you. Not your paper, not your presentation, none of that. The number one thing you have to work on to win listings is you. It starts with your presentation. It is so terrible to say that we live in a world that you have to present yourself in a certain way for what people form opinions of you. But I'm telling you, if you want to win listings, especially if you're competing, you have got to be on point in your presentation. And that means you drive up, it does, you don't have to have an expensive car, but it needs to be clean. You can have Fruit Loops in the back seat, I don't care, but make sure the tires are clean because they're looking out the window when you drive up to make their impression so, or form their opinion. So back to this outfit, this is a 2015, 2016 era outfit. <laughs> I say that because every year I would pick a listing appointment outfit for myself. I don't know if you know about Einstein, but Einstein had five different suits that were the same exact suit. He wore the same suit every day, different suit, but same suit. You catch me? His mentality was, if I wear the same suit every single day, then I no longer have to think about or use the brain power for what I intend to wear that day. 
So I adopted that in my uh, real estate career and every single listing appointment that I went on, I wore the same outfit. Those people are never going to see me again, other than maybe at closing, you know, wear a different outfit, but they didn't know uh, if I have five listing appointments that week, I wore the same outfit every day. And I didn't have to think about what I was going to wear. Um, <clears throat> and so I say this is from the two, 2015 era. This outfit, I probably took down the most listings in my real estate career with. So the only thing different was the shoes. I didn't wear the teats or heels. So heels are nice. So um, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy a lot of expensive clothing. I'm just saying have a system. You'll also notice if any of you see my picture, this is very similar to what I have on my business card. So when you develop and market yourself, you know, if you're going to try to wear, I always try to use the same color schemes, you know, it always appear in black and white. When I got to the property, they had already seen my marketing materials. They perhaps had seen a business card. So when I showed up, <clears throat> I felt like it was um, something that resonated with them, that they already knew me. It built, built trust, you know, kind of continued the marketing that I had already done. So um, let's get into this presentation. Just take notes as we go along. And then if you have questions as we move through, we'll stop for them. Um, so this initial call, this is going to take you from the start of <clears throat> my contact with the client all the way through the listing. So the initial call can come in many ways. I mean, you all are supposed to be making your phone calls now. And, you know, it may, may be something, I got this one piece of hair. <laughs> Um, where the person calls and says, hey, Darren, you know, I got your email and we're thinking about selling the house and we wouldn't mind seeing what we could get for it. Would you know your next step to say? What would it sound like? Oh, I'm going to ask you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, but if I sent an email, I'd say, let me get together. Let me talk to you about working with the agency and then we can proceed. I can get you some, um, I'll be doing a CMA. I can talk to you about what your house could be for. We're trying to think so we're in the marketplace and then uh, we go from there. Okay. It, it must happen too, but you know, I've learned all of it. You know, using the word CMA. They don't know. They don't know what it means. Right. Or someone does, someone does. Yeah, and that, I'm so glad you said that, Jim, because that is the bulk of this presentation today. What I find is as agents, we get so caught up in our lingo, our language, our technology, that we, for, we forget and skip over a lot of the stuff that is very important to sellers um, by our lingos, our technologies, and what we think their expectations are. So when, when I show you um, the pre-listing package, we'll go over some of that. So anytime someone called me, about listing a property, the number one thing in my mind was set the appointment. Set the appointment. When you talk to a person that's saying anything about selling a house, getting numbers, set the appointment. So the initial call comes in, <clears throat> you listen first. See that part says discussion about their needs. They're probably gonna give you a laundry list of what they're thinking. So just listen intently. When they're done telling you all about their familial situation or why they're selling or why they're thinking about it, then you need to set the stage to receive, um, a, for them to receive a pre-listing email, which I will give you. So that would sound something like this. Hey, Bob, what can I help you with today? Well, Amanda, you know, we're thinking about selling a house. Okay. Well, probably the first thing we need to do is figure out how much it is. So... How about I come over and take a look at the house? It'll only take me about 20 or 30 minutes. I won't have to sit in front of you for two hours. And following that, I'll get you a comparative market analysis or a market evaluation. And I'll email that out to you. And then we can discuss it. And they'll say, yeah, that sounds good. So at that point, if I'm sitting in front of my computer, I'll go ahead and pull up my calendar. And I give them two options. You'll see this later in the presentation. If you say, when can I come over? Does anybody know when they're going to tell you to come over? Never. Never? Girl, 
<laughs> no, they're going to say Saturday at three. What are you doing? What are you doing at Saturday at three? That's right. That's right. So what I've learned is you don't ever open up to your client for them to give you their schedule. You give them two slot slots. Now, I adopted working Monday through Friday, nine to five, and I did have the nine to five Dolly Parton song for you guys, but we missed it this morning. Um, and that came from working every weekend and on a new construction site or an open house for like every weekend of an entire year, not going on any vacation. And I thought, this is not why I'm doing this. I am not going to spend every weekend of my life away from my family trying to support my family when I'm not even getting to be with them. You can do real estate nine to five. I'm not saying don't work on Saturday or Sunday, you know, if you need to show a house or whatever, but give people two options. I think on this example in here, I've got, I've got Monday at five and I've got Friday at three, which is better for you. And then we'll pick one. It's amazing. <laughs> So that keeps you out of just going every Saturday at three, burning up your time. So, okay, on this phone call, <clears throat> set the appointment. If you're in front of your computer, pull it up. Give them two options. Let them pick. If you can set the appointment, set it at time in your calendar. If you happen to be in the car, hey, you know what? Bob, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but why don't you go ahead and text me your email address and as soon as I get in front of a computer, I will email you some time slots that I have available. And oh, by the way, I'm gonna go ahead and email you our pre-listing package so you know a little bit about us before we get there. Okay? Okay, Amanda, that sounds great. So what you've done in the initial contract is you've set the stage to make the appointment. That's always the objective. Set the appointment. Doesn't matter if you think they're gonna list, doesn't matter if they're gonna do it a year from now. I don't care if they're gonna list a year from now, set the appointment and go. Because once they get the information from you, they may decide it's time to move up their plan, right? I mean, once you tell them, hey, you know, we can probably get 300,000 for this house now, but I can't assure you of that in six months from now. Wouldn't that kind of get things this, right? Okay, so on the initial call, gosh, I should have brought my glasses. I'm so sorry, guys. Okay, set the stage for the appointment to take 20 minutes. That is going to save you so much time and you'll be able to spend it with your family instead of theirs. So, um, and then ask them to text you their email address. Any questions on that part? Set, set the appointment, set the expectation of what's going to happen. Okay, so here goes email number one. As soon as I get back to my office, this is what I email them. You can copy paste this. Just so you know, I'm systemizing everything in my business because that saves you lots of time. And over on the left-hand side of the screen, you can't really see it up here, but if you scroll down on my folders, I've got one that's, um, I've got one that's listed as CMA slash listing appointments. And I keep these emails in it. So all I have to do is go over there, copy, paste into an email, put their name and hit send. Okay, so um, email number one. Hey, Bob, I enjoyed so much speaking with you earlier per our conversation. I've attached our pre-listing package so you know a little about us um, and what to expect from our marketing plan. I also attached a working with real estate agents brochure for your review prior to the meeting. I do not need it back at this time. I only need about 20 to 30 minutes to see your home through the eyes of a buyer so I can perform a market analysis and create a strategic plan to get your home sold. If needed, we'll provide you with advice on suggested upgrades and repairs. I'm not seeing it on here. Oh, it's cause Shelby, let me shrink this for you guys. Repairs at our meeting. Okay, here you go. As of now, I have availability Friday month, Friday at five, Monday at five. Which would you prefer? So you're doing two things here. You're going to give them the um, pre-listing package. I'm about to pop that up. It's attached to this email. And you're going to give them a working with real estate agents for sure. I find that if I ask them to sign it, it becomes a hurdle. Is Amy in here? <laughs> Okay, I specifically tell them I don't need it back at this time 
because I will actually include that in the listing documents. I send them via um, DocuSign when they list the property. Usually on at that time, I will put the date that I sent this out. So if I send it a month from now, I will put the date in the working with the real estate agents on the date that I sent this out. <clears throat> so let me, um, okay, you're specifically telling them here, they don't have to do repairs before you get there. A lot of sellers think they know what to do to their house right now and they don't have a clue. They think they need to go in there and put $10,000 with granite countertops. And in fact, they'd actually be overbuilt for the neighborhood. So you're letting them know here, look, don't do anything to the house until I get there. And I'll let you know if anything needs to be done when I get there. So let me, um, I'm gonna pop up my, um, you guys are gonna be amazed at how simple this is. Okay, so as mentioned, I, you know, there's plenty of stuff you can pull up in KW, like Darshan, where can I pull a listing presentation? Oh, from design. Yeah, tell me about that. Like, is that like 20 pages? Oh yeah. <laughs> what does it talk about? Yeah, it's like 16 pages about who Keller Williams is. There's a place for you to put all kinds of different um, testimonies um, and you just go in and take their text out and put your own in, but it's already got pictures and you can put pictures if you have pictures of the actual house that you're going to see. So you can um, make it specific to that house. Okay, that's good. That's nice and fancy, but 16 pages for me, they're not gonna look at it. <laughs> I mean, are they? But if you feel the need to do that, then do so. You can start with something like that or you are welcome to take this and put your name and your face up there. I don't care. Um, so on the first page, you know, I, I found in real estate, all the listing presentations that I have been kind of given from my companies, it was all about the company, which is great. I mean, we have a great company, but I thought, you know what, why isn't, why aren't I doing a resume on myself? Because if they're hiring me, shouldn't I be doing that? So on this first page, that's kind of what I did, but I didn't want it to look like a resume. So I just did these kind of bullet points. So, <clears throat> you know, you put your name, you put your slogan, nice photo of yourself. Please make sure that when you get to the listing appointment, you look somewhat like your photo. Don't, right? Otherwise they're gonna feel deceived from the get-go. So um, you, your knowledge and education, I mean, you don't have to have a bunch of fancy degrees. You can think back over whatever you've done, real estate school, any kind of um, electives you can put on here, any, any kind of certifications you have, just kind of talk yourself up a little bit on your knowledge and education. Um, and then your experience, it doesn't have to be real estate experience. Um, like on here, I have corporate management and ownership experience. Well, that really doesn't have a lot to do with real estate, even though I used it in real estate. <clears throat> so the experience level, you don't have to have 20 plus years in the business. You can have, um, you can add up Darshan's real estate experience in mine. And, you know, you literally, all of you have over 20 years experience working with you right now, which is yours. So um, if you, okay, your results. We found that over 80% of our clients were repeat and referral. So we wanted to put that on here. Um, and then if you have any kind of um, nonprofits that you donate to, you can feel free to put this on here. Um, of course, put your information on here. Now let's get into marketing strategy. And this is what is a laughably simple about this. So I found that in all those marketing um, materials that I was provided by my other companies, <clears throat> it skipped over all the basic stuff that we do. Like, look at this. Inform you of current market conditions in your neighborhood. Well, that's something we do anyway, right? But if you don't tell them that, aren't we missing something? We just rush in there with some big presentation and say, well, our company is great. And these are our numbers and blah, 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 blah. How is that relevant to them? So you're telling them here, I'm gonna let you know about the market. I'm gonna help you determine fair market value. Well, a lot of them are clueless on what their home is worth. 
So these basic things that we do, I found everybody skipping over. And so it's actually a very strong point of this presentation because, or pre-listing package because it's telling them what they need. But it's the basic things that we do as realtors that none of the other realtors that go on listing appointments are saying that they do. Are you guys reading some of this? Pull the tax records. I mean, don't we do that for every one of them? <laughs> um, make suggestions for improvements. Prepare your listing documents. A lot of them are afraid of the forms. Um, <clears throat> give you a sample offer to purchase. Okay, now if you're going to use this for your own, those two things at the bottom, where I have scheduled professional photographer, if you plan to do your own photos, please take that out. I do find that you could get it done at a very reasonable price. It's usually in the $100 range and it really pushes your listings to the top to have a professional photographer do the photos because they have wide angle lenses that we don't have. Um, and then also I schedule an appraiser to do the measurements for me. Not because I don't know how, because I hate measuring houses. So what, so, Jim? So the professional photographer and appraiser, is that optional? Because I remember when I first came to KW, I found that it's kind of required. I have no idea. Is that required here? No. Yeah. They kind of expected us to do it when I first got into real estate. So, I mean, there's nothing like tromping around the house trying to figure out whether to take the staircase out or walking in a bunch of dog poo around corners or... You know, one of the big things is, is that if you're gonna have somebody else measure your houses for you and they're not licensed, like an appraiser, you are held responsible for anything that they did wrong. So you're allowed a five percent error in the MLS, and if you are different from that, then it's your fault, not whoever you paid. But if you hire an appraiser, it's their license, and they're responsible for how they. Do. Yeah, appraisers are con considered to be um, kind of the highest standard of measurement above us. So if you hire a licensed appraiser to do it, then it does release you of a little bit of the liability. Now, there are companies out there that market that they will measure for you. And I encountered one of them last year. My appraiser that usually measures for us was on vacation or something. I need to get a listing in. <clears throat> well, I called them and they were actually not, they were not licensed appraisers. Um, yet they were touting themselves as being able to measure properties. And so you do have to make sure that whoever you're um, subcontracting has the right credentials in order for it to be okay with, the real estate commission. Okay. Any questions on that? No. So one something to get back kind of the, the listing point. Okay. Some people I know love to see those presentations. Maybe the majority, majority of people don't, but you know, some people, especially high-end houses, they kind of expect that. So can you get, leave a gap in your presentation just in case somebody else will see that? If you want to do that, by all means, do it. I will tell you, um, there's some method behind the madness of everything that I've done over the years. And I, I, in our program, we will do disc profiles coming up. Um, that's one thing that we need to do um, for one of the activities in track. But basically, if you've never done a disc before, has everybody done a disc? Raise your hand. Okay, so there's a couple of people that have not. Uh, personality assessment, not a test. There basically are only four personality types that we're all comprised of in some way, shape or form. We usually lead with one or two personality types. Um, to give you an example of two, um, some people can be data-driven individuals. Those would be like your IBMers. They only care about the numbers and the data. Other people, are that you could go to them with all the data in the world and all they care about is 
your family and your kids and their kids. And so I'm not saying anything good or bad about one or the other. I'm just saying that when you, you need to learn personality <clears throat> styles because when you go on a listing appointment, you will know immediately who that person is. Um, and when you figure that out, then you need to start speaking to that. If you go to, I'm telling you right now, hands down, if you get, does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say an IBM or? No. Okay, that's kind of um, localized to this area. So you go to an IBM or's house and you pull out the stuff about a bunch of fuzzy feeling nonprofits and family and all of that stuff, they're gonna be looking at you like, there ain't no way I'm getting this person to list my house. Right? Mm -hmm. You whip out a spreadsheet for them, they're going to be like, oh, I'm, this person's listing my house. <laughs> so if you back up to that first page, you will notice that Amanda has touched on every one of those personality styles. We have the stuff about the knowledge, education, experience for those IBMers. Then at the bottom, we got the warm fuzzy feeling stuff about giving back to the church. And we do. There was one year that we gave 50% of our grace to the church. Every commission, half it. I was on a 50-50 split with Jesus. <laughs> so um, this, this is, is touching on a lot of things that you don't realize in its simplicity. <clears throat> it's speaking to a lot of different people groups. Now, what you'll also find is when you get there, husband and wife usually going to be opposite personalities. You probably experienced that in your own home. So you need to be prepared to speak to both of them in such a way that you're not giving all the attention to one personality style and not the other. So, I mean, you have to be strategic when you do this and know who you're talking to and what information they want. Okay, so let's go to after listing. Um, of course, you're going to give them a listing package. You're going to put the for sale by the sign up, the lockbox, you know, enter the stuff in MLS. Look how simple this stuff is, but all the other agents are skipping over the fact that they do these things. Now, at the bottom, um, you know how I have been coaching you guys to do your mail outs. Look at the bottom. Um, we are going to call any buyers. Um, that we're working with and may be interested in your home. Um, where is this part? There's something about our mail outs in here. Does anybody see it? Okay, there you go. Sent, we sent a monthly mail out to over 500 past clients and contacts that send us buyers and sellers regularly. We'll review price and condition based on buyer's agent feedback and market conditions. And we remind you to send referrals if possible because the other sellers have already been prompted to refer us clients that may help you. Does anybody say that when they go to a listing appointment? No. What are you telling them? That you have created a funnel through your mail outs, Josh. <laughs> of continuous buyers and sellers that are coming into your funnel that may or may not help them. And then what you're doing is forward thinking and preparing them to do the same, to create lifelong referrals for you. Once they know and understand this is how you run your business, it plants a seed in them to say, you know what, Josh came and he said that <clears throat> he's mailed out to all those people for months and months and months, and those people might buy our house. And, you know, when he sells ours, then we're already kind of prepared to send him some referrals that might help somebody else sell their house, right? So you're casting the professionalism <clears throat> that you actually are already doing, and you need to capitalize on that, but telling them this here. Um, <clears throat> You can read through these things. We don't have to go over them all here, but um, some of these things, like I said, they're so, so simple and things that um, other people, like look at acceptance of offer. Make sure potential buyers are pre-qualified for a loan to purchase or verify that they have cash to purchase. Nobody's saying that when they go on listing appointments, but that speaks volumes to a seller. Is something that we do kind of in our sleep that we know we have to do, but this is just really putting on paper what we actually do, how we bring value. It doesn't have to be very fancy. It doesn't have to be a huge listing appointment. Now, Jim, if you want to do that 20 pager for that, I mean, I'm fine with that. Absolutely. But 
And I mean, if you email that out, <clears throat> I don't, I would have to think through their impression of that, how many of them would actually read through it. It might be a thing where you actually do have to sit at their table for a couple of hours and go over that with them and be really good at it. Um, okay, so let me flip back to the email, wherever it was. Okay, so we were on email number two. Anybody, any questions before we move forward? Nope, you guys are quiet today. I don't know if I'm just that boring or are you just that quiet? Okay, good. All right, so no, email number three, as you will see, this is optional. This process, even though it's systemized, has always been organic for me. Yes, I have a column where I can copy paste this information, but it's organic in that I actually read through it before I send it. I will add things into, you know, hey, it was so nice to meet you and your dog Einstein. I mean, I add stuff like that um, when I copy paste into it. So um, email number three is optional. Um, and you will notice that it is post appointment. Oh no, we skipped email number two. Hey, you guys, wake up. <laughs> email number two, optional before appointment. Okay, here's some gold. How do you gather information about the house before you put it in the MLS? Does anybody have a system they use? Research. Right? Okay, how do you, so if you ask them, how are you logging that information? In your head? Property disclosure, very good, Josh. Okay. All right, so here's the deal that was so irritating for me. Literally, I wanted to be in and out as quickly as possible. That was not only for their family, but for mine too. Um, I mean, I would show up, they'd have kids running around and I was like, you know what, they don't even need to be here staring at me and then spending time with their kids. I need to spend time with mine. So let's make this as quick and painless as possible. The biggest holdup for me was how do I find out all the information about this house to have all the marketing information that I need, have all the disclosure information that I need, have all of the HVA, HVAC, electrical, all that blah, 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 blah stuff. I hated it. I did not show up with a property disclosure saying, let's fill this out while we're here because I did not want to fill it out while I was there. I wanted to email it to them, have them fill it out and send it back to me. <laughs> so, Most of the time they don't want you, you know, <clears throat> to sit there and fill it out. Right, they don't want you in, the, in their house any more than we want to be in their house all, all that time. So I will tell you what I did. You, If you choose to do so, it is a golden system. I actually um, create, I, I had a survey monkey account. I created a survey monkey because those are easy to fill out, right? Anybody ever done a survey monkey? Um, I no longer have my survey monkey account, but what I realized was <clears throat> last night when I put this email together, they still have the link active. So when I click on this link, I've been able to come up now, it did last night. Um, please don't use this because I have no idea where it's going. I don't know why they left this link active because I don't even use it anymore. But look at all these questions. What's your name? What's your address? Um, the best email. You're gonna need that when you enter um, the showing instructions set up. You're gonna need their phone numbers when you do that. More than likely, you'll, you already have all that information, but if you don't, this is a good way to grab it. <clears throat> um, where are you referred? If so, put it here. Um, why are you selling? What's your loan balance? Make sure you've sent them working with agents before you ask them that question. And as, as you will recall, that was on email number one, okay? Um, do you need to purchase the home as well? Hopefully you already know that, but if not, you might pick it up here. Um, it asks them uh, what, what price do they want? Um, and then as you, as you get through the bottom here, you will see that I have actually 
implanted the questions that I'm going to need to input the MLS listing <clears throat> and fill out the property disclosure, um, all this stuff. Do you have a fireplace? I mean, I don't ask that when I go on a listing presentation. Sometimes I see it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I've looked at five houses in a week and I have no idea what that one looks like. I mean, <clears throat> so you can create your own survey monkey and it will give you a link that you can actually put here. See, I have it here. Um, and to the side, Josh, there you go. If you don't wanna do a survey monkey to gather the information, then you can attach the um, property disclosure here as a PDF and ask them to fill it out and get it back to you. So, um, Amanda, how many questions was that survey that you chose? 30, oh wow, it's Yeah, I mean, that's just stuff they, that we need to know. Look at number 52, how would you like your home to be show? You want it go as show, you want it courtesy call, you want an appointment required. I don't wanna have that conversation a hundred times in a year. I mean, I mean, you know, if you have it here, you don't really have to um, have the conversation a hundred times because it's here. And then I always love number 53. We want their feedback on what we could have done better. So you use this religiously and, and yeah, this will show them a level of professionalism that every other agent they're interviewing misses. And did you get uh, basically all 53 questions answered in time soon? Yep, I did. And guess what I did with it thereafter? For those of you that are planning to build a team, once they, once they answer this survey, you can download it as a PDF to put in your electronic file. And then you have in writing from the seller everything they've answered on it. Like if they told you something verbally at the listing appointment, like, do you have anything that's been unpermitted? Well, you don't have any backup. But once they fill this out, if you ask them, is there anything unpermitted? And they say, yeah, our, our screen porch is. Then you have that on record as in a PDF in your file where you can always look back to it and say, well, what did the seller say to me? Because not all of it's covered on the property disclosure. Does that make sense? Oh, building teams. So here's what we would do when our sellers would issue this back to us. And I know you guys are not ready for that step or um, most, most of you are not yet, but um, this would actually go to my um, assistant so that she could, do the, she could do the marketing and the listing. But if I had gathered all that information in person while I was there verbally, I would actually have to write it out in some way to get it to Kathy so she could enter it. You know, this way I was in and out in 20 to 30 minutes. I didn't have to take notes. This gathered every bit of information that I needed. I was able to forward this to my marketing team to input the listing, get it active. It was accurate information. All I had to do was send out the listing docs, get the signature back and roll. Make. So. <clears throat> it's fine, I, I, I hate survey. I hate doing surveys myself personally. I didn't know somebody do 53 questions. I think how many, so how many, how many sellers would you say that do this survey actually sign? I, I got to guess it's gotta be like 95%. It's probably over that. So that's, you sort of have like an, they have an investment in you. you know, it, so. yeah. yeah. Well, and like I said, this is a level of professionalism. They're not seeing with other agents. Right. The other agents are showing up with that 20 page pr presentation. Right. Seriously, I do not mean this to sound prideful or egotistical. You have got to refine yourself and set yourself above the crowd. Whatever every other listing agent's doing, you got to find something different to rise above it. And this is what I did. I mean, by the time they got through with this, I knew there was another agent in my market that was doing it better than I was doing it. I mean, that sounds terrible. I'm such a humble person, but no other agent was doing this. I've never shared this with anybody. You have, a, you have an exclusive look at what I did to win listings. 
and it had nothing to do with what I took to the listing. It was the pre-listing package. It was the words that come out of my mouth like a recorder as soon as they say we're thinking about selling. Well, my script was I need to come out, spend about 20 minutes at the house, won't take long, you don't have to clean. I can come out Monday or Friday, which is better. Set the appointment and then shift right into that. Do exactly what I said, send them the pre-listing package. They already know our marketing plan when I get there. I don't have to prove myself when I get there. That marketing plan was derived from everything that sold the previous year. And I was able to tell them that. If they ever asked me to adjust my marketing plan for their specific needs, the answer was no. I am so sorry, Mr. Seller, but we evaluate our budgeting model and our marketing strategy on the previous year and how many homes we sold. And we develop our marketing plan based on that each year. Every home we sell gets the same superior service. And if I adjust that for you, then I would have to adjust it for everyone else to be fair to them. Same with listing commission. Do you honestly wanna cut your commission for one person who may or may not have a conversation with another person that you listed their house for and figure out there's a percent difference in what the both of them were charged. You wanna talk about suicide as an agent? <laughs> that is, I mean, it was never acceptable in our business. Anybody asked me to cut a commission, immediately what would come out of my mouth was, we don't discount commission unless we take multiple listings or if it's a builder account because they bring us multiple listings. Sometimes we took two listings because of that. They brought me two listings, I come down to five. But you don't want cut down someone below that and then figure out that their friend down the street got a different deal. So <clears throat> does that make sense? Sure. You could do that survey in Google Sheets and it would be a spreadsheet for you. You would put all the information into a spreadsheet and you can make mail and address labels and everything. Oh, I don't know how to do that. But if you want to, I mean, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Plus, it would probably be no cost. The Survey Monkey uh, costed me, I want to say, like 30 bucks a month. Um, but we had several surveys too. Like, we, after we closed, we'd send them a survey about their their service, which we use as testimonials on marketing. Um, so, all right, let's talk about the actual listing appointment. So, um, a few of you have heard me tell this story before. What time is it? Um, I used to be so, so, so prepared because I'm a prepared type, prepared type person. I want all of my stuff to back me up when I get there so I feel knowledgeable and confident. And I was in this listing class one time. I think it was Kent Temple that was doing it at um, the Cary Market Center. And he, and some of you have heard me say this, but for those of you that have not, <clears throat> he made the statement that all you have to do is show up. And I was like, that is not correct. <laughs> I know because I need my data for my IBMers. I need all that stuff. Okay. So I decided that I would put his theory to the test. So at the time, I mean, we were trying to set five listing appointments a week. So whereas I didn't want to blow one of them, I decided I was going to try the theory. So I went with nothing but my phone to this listing appointment, just to prove this guy wrong. And what I learned was all I had to do was show up because I had refined myself in such a way that everything that seller needed was in here. And, it, and I was able to make it come out of my mouth in such a way and send this stuff beforehand so that when I got there, they just wanted to sign and be done. So I'm not telling you to go to listing appointments unprepared. What I'm telling you is they are purchasing you, you, your services. That sounds terrible. They're, they're not purchasing your company. It's you. you. You know, we have got to get serious about refining ourselves and practicing mastery of our trade. Mastery means 
you do whatever you have to to make sure you are the premier agent. I don't care how many classes you got to go to, I don't know how many scripts you got to learn, I don't know how many data you need to memorize in your head, but it needs to be able to pop off out of you into, into them while you're there. And then you can just show up and get the listing. So, um, oh, listings. Okay, so here's what I would do when I had the listing. I used to go with that big folder, you know, and all my stuff. But as I grew, and for those of you that don't know how to, if you go to the Facebook page, I have step-by-step -step instructions on everything we did before a listing. And it was comprised of, yes, you need to pull the tax record. You need to pull a GIS map of the property so you know about where the lines are when you get there. By pulling that GIS ortho map, you can kind of see if there's a property owner encroaching onto the property, you know, if there's a fence on it, if there's a building on it. Um, you can overlay a flood zone. It's not 100% accurate, but at least it gives you an indication if there's some kind of flood zone on the property so you can ask about it when you get there. Now, I will tell you this, and this is so element elementary for us, but if you will go to the Register of Deeds, and pull up their survey or a plat map and load it onto your iPad. <laughs> they are gonna think you are the bee's knees when you get there. I don't know why, but I would show up and I would have that plat map on my iPad. And sometime during my appointment, I would say, yes, I see here and I would blow it up so they could see it was a registered document from the register of deeds. I see here that you've got a drainage easement on the back, you know, or I see here that there's, you know, a fence encroachment, whatever you see, or I see here that your lot looks pretty clean. I mean, there's nothing that is a red flag here, but for some reason, even though that's very simple for us, electronics and a register of deeds, they seem to think you've gotten some information that is not easily accessible about them. And they appreciate that. They appreciate your diligence. They appreciate you already knowing. Sometimes you get there and you know more stuff than they know about their house. So what I did was, and if you go back to the Facebook page, it teaches you how to pull up the tax records, pull up the ortho, pull up the plat map, and then download it. Does, if you use Dropbox, and that was what we chose to use, um, download it into a Dropbox file. And once you have Dropbox, you can pull it up on, a, on your laptop, you can pull it up on an iPad, you can pull it up on your phone. And it's so useful because during the transaction, countless times I'll be driving down the road or I'll be out of town and somebody will need something in the file and I'll say, oh, hold on a minute, let me pull it up in my Dropbox. One, two, three, and I've got it on my phone. Um, to tell them whatever it is or somebody needs a form same thing <clears throat> um, so that I would highly suggest going to um, that Facebook page and, and doing those steps to set up your Dropbox get it integrated across all of your devices learn how your filing system um, on how you want to set, set up your files I mean for us it was the year in which we were working so it would be like 2021 and then it would be the street address, Tally Ho 233. So then if I search my Dropbox, then I would just go to the 2021 files and figure it out. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so showing up for your listing appointment real quick before we move forward, I would show up, no files, no nothing. This is how I would show up. I have my phone, I have my iPad. This is so terrible, but I would always make sure the Apple was out. And I would have a business card. You will notice that this has pockets. I would have my business card in this pocket. I would have my car keys in this one. That makes me light. I don't have to take in a bunch of stuff. I don't have to remember about forgetting something in the house. I look ready to go when I get there. And if I need something, it's in my iPad. I have a little um, styler that I took note with, notes with if I had to while I was there. Um, so it just made a very clean... Um, presentation. I mean, when I got there, I had my business card. I always knew where it was. Hi, I'm Amanda. You know, tell some, validates who you are. They don't know already. 
Um, and every single time I showed up, it was the same thing. Business card. Hi, I'm Amanda. I have my keys and this, you know, <laughs> every single thing. Same, th same thing. So you need to be systemized. Um, okay, so let's move on to <clears throat> after the appointment. And by the way, while you're at the appointment, these things allow you to have the small talk while you're there. I mean, you basically show up and say, okay, well, go ahead and give me the grand tour. You know, let them lead you through the house, look at it while you're going through for the purposes of one, doing your CMA. Number two, if you see anything that might red flag a disclosure, go ahead and ask them about it. Unpermitted square footage is the most common. I mean, if I see a porch that looks like it used to be a deck and now it's a screen porch, I'll just say, oh, by the way, did you happen to permit your porch? And they'll usually say, I don't know or no, and that frightens them. So what I'm always prepared to say is, you know what, it's not a problem. It's not gonna, it's not gonna determine um, what we get in offers on your home, but my job is to help you make the correct disclosures so that when you walk away from the closing table with your check, I don't want anybody ever coming back trying to get any of it. So what I find is if we make those disclosures on the property disclosure now, it won't prevent us from getting offers nor will it affect the value of them. However, if we don't do a good job telling them that now, then it could potentially come up during the transaction or post-transaction, and it actually could end up hurting us. And at that point, you kind of see this from the sellers and they start telling you everything that could potentially be a disclosure. And then it's your job to actually make notes on the property disclosure. Any questions on that? You know what? I had a contractor tell me that last year, but try explaining that to the real estate commission. What you will find at the real estate commission is a consumer protection agency. They have no interest whatsoever in protecting us. If a consumer can claim that they were misre misrepresented in any way, shape or form, and it's caused them harm, doesn't matter if it costs 30,000 or not. That's always been my approach. Potentially you could get off the hook, but you would actually have to go through court to figure it out. You don't want to ever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but, and, and especially like, you know, you could actually add a bedroom for under 30 and say, well, you know, I didn't have to get it permitted because it was under 30. But then when it comes right down to it, you've turned a three bedroom home into a four bedroom home and it's only a three bedroom set dick. Well, that's a different story. Yeah, so yeah, if, if you know the regulation and you feel comfortable with it, then go for it. But there's a whole plethora of other nightmares that could come from from it. But in the very least, even if they did not get it permitted and it was under 30,000, go ahead and make the representation. I mean, we always say, um, you know, the addition on the back, unpermitted, or either um, unknown if it's unpermitted, unknown if it's permitted, if it was done by a previous owner. Um, and then you will have to make the determination on the square footage of the house. Because technically, if it's not permitted, um, or if it's not heated and cooled, or if it doesn't meet the building requirements of bedrooms, you know, if it doesn't have an egress and a closet, da 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 da, da that's so many things. Um, but you can't advertise it as heated square footage if it's not permitted. Not to say that we haven't before. There have been some situations where it would have been so detrimental to the house and the search criteria um, that if we had not included it as square footage, um, it, it, the house just would not have a, appeared in any of the searches and therefore we made the choice to advertise it but fully disclose that it was unpermitted. Um, so kind of a case by case I guess. All right so email number three post appointment. Um, market study on your neighborhood. Okay, so when you get to the point where you're going on a lot of listing appointments every week, what you're going to find is difficulty in actually doing the, 
the market analysis. If you do a really good market analysis, depending on the property, if it's a cookie cutter house, I could usually do it, turn it and burn it in under 30 minutes. If it was a residential property that had 10 acres and you know, it was in Timbuktu, it would usually take me an hour. So what I found myself running into was I hated doing CMAs. I love the listing appointments, but I hated doing the CMAs and I always procrastinated on doing them because my schedule got so hectic. <clears throat> so this optional email number three is something I would send the sellers to buy me time. If I knew that I wanted to get them some information the day of or the day after I went to the appointment, but it was going to take me a day or two to get them their CMA, I would send them this. That's why it's optional. Now, I will tell you, I've got to give credit to Bold. Um, for those of you that have never taken Bold, I highly suggest it. I suggest taking it repeatedly. Um, when I was sitting in Bold, they actually gave us a listing presentation. It was designed to go to the property and sit there for longer than I wanted to sit there. So when I took Bold, I, I took Diana's information. It was Diana Kokoska who was running Bold at the time. And I said, you know, how do I do this and not, not have to go sit there for an hour or two at their house? And a lot of these emails are exactly that. It's verbiage that I took from Bold that I chose to display in an email instead of a face-to-face. -face. This is one of them. Um, and, and so is the next. Um, uh, so I basically just sent them the stats on their neighborhood, but it was different stats than most people send. Most people are gonna send what's sold in your neighborhood, right? Well, look at this. I'm telling them how many homes are on the market around them or in their neighborhood. How many homes have sold in the past 12 months? How many homes are selling per month? And then the supply of homes in the neighborhood. This is also something that we capitalized on heavily in our listings. Um, what I found was no agents in the market were doing absorption studies on their listings. All they were doing was pulling sold comps and giving them the CMA with the sold comps. So let me ask you something. You go and you pull your comps for six months back. You got three of them. Those three homes sold two months ago, four months ago, six months ago, and that's what you've pulled your numbers off of. I'm gonna ask you right now, if a house sold six months ago for $200,000, what would it sell for tomorrow? $235. Thank you, Josh. $240. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> So if you've presented them with the traditional CMA of three closed properties, have you done them justice? No, they need another conversation. That's exactly right. And that's why you should always inform them, not only of what's active that buyers have to choose from, but you need to run an absorption study for them. <clears throat> that sounds difficult. I didn't plan on going over it today. But basically to make it very simple, if you draw a five mile circle around the house in MLS and you pull active, pending and sold properties over the last six months in about the price range that they're gonna be selling in, let's say it's 250 to 275, pull active, pending and sold. Once you pull that list, you can do a CMA summary. You can sort the list where it's active listings at the top. Well, actually the CMA summary does that to you. Boom, in an instant, it'll give you how many actives there are, how many pendings there are, and how many closed there are. Now, some of you may wanna take notes on this. The closed units is where you start with your absorption study. If you see in that five mile radius that 12 properties have sold in the past six months. How many are selling per month? Was that you, Christina? Yes, two. Two are selling per month. The second step is to look how many are on the market. If there are four active homes 
and two selling per month, how many months supply do you have? Two months supply. Okay, you will see a reference in email number three right beside those asterisks that say, a five to six month supply of homes is a neutral market. For any of you that don't know, five to six months is a neutral. Hi, bye. Okay, so five to six months is a neutral market. If you are below five month supply of homes, you're in a seller's market. Are you okay? Does he sound okay? Okay. Um, okay, if you're above six months supply, you're in a buyer's market. How many in here have ever experienced a buyer's market? Oh, I'm gonna give you the goods in a minute. <laughs> okay. So you need to run an absorption study. You can, you can use this email to kind of help you through that. If you need more training on it, um, let me know. Um, once you figure out what kind of supply of homes you have, I mean, right now we're pretty much under a month supply everywhere. But sellers don't know that. They don't know that. So once you give this to them, they're like blown away that you actually can run some stats and tell them what the supply and demand is for their home. So a lot of times right now I'm running CMAs and I'm telling them, look, look at the active homes that are around you that buyers have to choose from. And when I see that there are none, I mean, I flat out tell the sellers, look, we can inflate this price and probably get it. I'm not telling you we'll get it to appraise, but my job is to get you the highest price on an offer. Right? So I'm going to give you the sold comp so you know about where it's going to appraise, but I'm also going to push the price up to the absolute most that I think I can get for you. And looking at the supply of homes and looking to see that there is nothing else for a buyer to choose from. If they plan to buy in Garner and they have $250,000 to spend in the next three months, what I know is when you hit the market, yours is the only choice. That is strong. So um, do your absorption studies, learn the talk. Um, okay, let's see. We've already covered the listing appointment prepare your device, give your business card, take notes. Okay, any, any questions before we move on? No. Okay. I will, oh, if anybody hasn't signed up, make sure you sign up okay. because what I'll do before I leave here is email all of you that are here this information. Okay. Um, Okay, email number four, post appointment. Here's the market email. And I have for fun left this in here. Does anybody see the date on this email? 2014, this is a direct copy paste from somebody that I emailed, took their names out, of course. Listen to this email. This is gonna shock you. For those of you that have never worked in a buyer's market, get ready. The seller's market is not going to stay forever. The environment that you're working in right now is short lived. So whereas we're going out, we're putting signs in the yard, we're getting multiple offers. Let me show you the other side. The other side of that is having 48 listings in a buyer's market where you got 40 listings to compete with as a seller. As a seller, you've got to stage, you've got to reduce pricing, you've got to have the best real estate agent on the planet <laughs> in order to sell your house. And not only that, as a listing agent, you're sitting there with a bunch of listing inventory and guess what those sellers are doing? They're calling you every week wanting to know why their house hasn't sold. That's tough. So listen to this email. Hello again, in evaluating your home, we looked at a five mile radius around you. Today, there are 14 homes on the market in your price range. Last week, zero sold. Can anybody imagine that? This happened, it's true. <laughs> that means 14 didn't sell and are still on the market. Our absorption study revealed only about a third of a home selling per month. 
So less than one home selling per month. That means we have over a 12 month supply of homes to compete with within five miles of yours. And I'm gonna get real. I've run absorption studies for years and years and years and years in my business. I ran them all the way through the recession and before. There were some homeowners that I had to tell that we had a 24 month supply of homes. Two years worth of inventory they had to compete against. And that's when you have to start talking to a lot of them about bringing $20,000 checks to closing to get rid of their mortgage. That's a very different environment than we're in right now. And that's why Gary Keller gave a shift. So if you've not read it, start reading it now. Um, let's see, five miles. Okay, I've got your little note here because I'm going to supply you with the email at the bottom for the seller's market, the one that you can do right now. But just for fun, I left this one in so that you know a few years from now, Whenever the shift happens, could be a few months, you can come back and say, oh, Amanda gave me that and now I can use this. So once again, our goal is to provide enough information for you to price your property in order to win the competition you're entering against the other homes available to buyers. In the link below, I've included some of those homes buyers will have to choose from, as well as some that have already sold. Based on looking through the interior pictures, comparing square footage, acreage, additional features, et cetera, et cetera, you should, now this is key. Buyers should respond with offers between X amount and X amount. Always give a range. You should never go to a seller and tell them their house is worth an exact amount. Because guess what ha happens when you get offers that are not that exact amount? Give them a range. And the sentence before that is key. Buyers should respond with offers. Notice I didn't say the market value of your home is between here and here. I said buyers should respond with offers between here and here. What's the difference? A lot of people also think when you give them a market value, that's in stone. But it's not. I mean, Darshan can tell you, got, you can have five different appraisers go out, look at the same house, or I'll come up with a different number. Yeah. And it can be thousands apart so what this is you're giving them information but you're not nailing yourself down to not the accuracy of the information but the validity of the information so you give them a range and I always explain to them what I usually do in this market is I'll give them an average range and then I will give them an inflated range and I will explain to them okay here's the price range if you go with the lower end of the price range, you are probably going to get multiple offers. It's going to go above list price, all of those things that we know happen. If you don't feel comfortable with trying to get your bidding war, and I'm not assuring you that you can, if you go on the top end of the range, then in this market, more than likely, you're still going to get multiple offers. Um, but in a normal market, in the five to six month supply neutral market, some of that conversation would be like, you know, you could go on the top end of the range. It may take you a little longer to sell, but you could at least try to get the higher price. And I will tell you, there's no danger in overpricing properties in this market. If you transition to a buyer's market, it is detrimental to a seller. You never, ever, ever take an overpriced listing in a buyer's market. Take them all day long right now, as far as I'm concerned. But what you're doing is hurting the seller and you're hurting yourself if you take an overpriced listing in a buyer's market. And as we get closer to that, if you guys are still with me, then we'll, we'll transition to that. Okay, so look at this next statement. It's golden. Touch base with me when you've had an opportunity to review and discuss strategically pricing to win the competition in the shortest amount of time for the most amount of money. That came straight from Diana Kokoska and Bold. What does that say to the seller? That's my objective, seller. Sell it the quickest, get the most. 
<laughs> right? Okay, so now this I added, and this is beautiful, 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 beautiful. Or if you know the price you'd like to start marketing at, please email or call me back and we'll send out your listing documents. That is bold, didn't come for bold. That's bold on Amanda's part, because guess what Amanda learned? 50% of the people will email you back, say put us on the market at 300. And guess what I have to do from then on? Send them a listing package and get started. I don't have to have any more discussions, none of that. We don't have to wait around for a couple of months. At least give them the opportunity to say, hey, we know what we want, let's get started. Most agents won't, won't do that. They won't be that direct. They'll want to have a conversation. And well, if they don't need a conversation, give them the option not to have one and just get rolling. Okay. So below, see where it says seller's market alternate paragraph for this email? Here's the one you would use in this market. Um, today, there are only two, two homes on the market in your price range. Absorption study revealed about 10 homes selling per month. That means we have less than a one month supply of homes to compete with within five miles of yours. This means you're still in a seller's market. Okay, that's the one you use for this market. As I said, I left the one in there from before for fun and you will need it. All right, this working with real estate agents brochure, let me tell you this, this is important. On that first email, when I send out, I've attached uh, working with agents for sure for your review. I don't need it signed back at this time, blah, 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 blah. I don't attach the one that you have in DocuSign. Does anybody know the psychology behind this? That's it, Josh. You can download this from the Real Estate Commission website. So, and, and that is exactly the key. It's non-offensive in that you're sending them disclosures they need to know, but you're not asking them to sign it at this time. It looks so much more professional and it does not look like a contract or a listing agreement that you're asking them to sign before you get them all this information. And somewhere in this email series, and we skipped over it, but there is a part that says, <clears throat> we, um, we do all of our documents at a later date electronically. So they know when I go to the listing appointment, they're not gonna have to sign anything. That is, that's tremendous value. I mean, some sellers have anxiety over that. Oh, this listing appointment, this listing is coming over here. We got some documents and she's probably gonna want us to sign them, but we don't know who I'm gonna list with her yet. You know. Just let them know before you go, you're not gonna make them sign anything until they have all the information. It's a nice visit. Okay, so that is pretty much the entirety of the process. You wanna to try to get them under agency though. Well, your agency is your listing agreement. So why wouldn't you switch them like you said, or would you want to get that? At least discuss it, I mean. I don't. You, you can, um, I used to do that. I used to do exactly what you said. I would take my listing forms. I would go over every item sitting at their kitchen table. But I was once sitting in a seminar and the person that was conducting it says, why would you go over every item in a listing agreement? You're not an attorney. So, I mean, you know, you could defer to Amy. She may want you to go over every single item, but I'm not an attorney. I'm not gonna sit there and try to explain to them attorney language. They, the Real Estate Commission doesn't even let us write in, but how many blanks? Because they know we're not capable. <laughs> so, the listing forms became what used to be the brunt of my listing appointment to an afterthought. I send it to them in DocuSign. I fill in all the blanks. I text them or call them and say, hey, I've issued your listing package. Please review it. Let me know if you have any questions. Sign it and send it by. Now that I'm not telling you that's the 100% best way or right way to do it. 
I just know that when that person in that seminar said to me one day, why are you going over every item in the listing agreement? You're not an attorney. I mean, and I thought, well, that's a true statement. Now that's not to say we shouldn't explain some of the bigger parts of it, um, but let's just face it, if they read through it, they understand pretty much everything that we understand about it, right? Um, and undoubtedly, if you sit there and you go over every item, when you get to the commission section, that's gonna be a discussion. And I will tell you over 90% of what we listed, commission never come up. It's not because I didn't disclose it. I went over and above to disclose it. Not only was it in a listing agreement, but I always, always, always include a seller proceeds example worksheet with my listing agreement. So I have their signature saying that I said, okay, if you get this purchase price, this, 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 and this is probably gonna be taken out and that's gonna be your net. Now that will save you because so many times in my career, I've gotten to the table and they seem to have forgotten paying me. <laughs> yeah, so you, and when I send that form out, it's good seeing you. I probably got to um, make a dash for it soon too, but um, you know, there, it is undeniable if they sign that form. I mean, it's numbers, it's not verbiage. It's numbers. When they see their list price on the top of that form, they're stopping the DocuSign. And so when she bring that form back out and say, oh, I'm so sorry. We went over it when we listed. Let me pull it up and, and see what the numbers said. I pull it up, I email it to them. They remember signing it. Um, so, um, and I also address listing commission when I send out the documents. Um, one of the questions that we almost always get, and I really, I really wish the NAR and the um, Bar Association would change the verbiage in the commission section, because you know you have to list the total commission, and then below it you have to list what you're paying out. Well, if you read it and you don't really reread it, it looks like they're having to pay the 6% plus the 2.4. So I always go ahead and answer that question before they even ask it and say our most common question is when you get to commission, the total is blank. It is not blank plus 2.4. So, and usually they never question it. Now, the, for the ones that do bring it up, and I know I've shared this with some of you in the, in the class, but actually it was Monzi and I don't think she's here, she's on vacation, but um, you need to know what your listings cost you. I practiced real estate for years and years and years and years. And for some reason, I thought they weren't costing me anything. But then at the end of the year, when I did my taxes, I said, you know what? If I actually take the cost of doing business, if I take the cost of my MLS fees, my split with my company, my um, gas bill, you know, my phone bill, blah, 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 blah everything it costs me to do business and I divide that by the number of transactions I did or how many listings I took, you immediately get a number of how much every transaction costs you. Early on in my career when I wasn't producing that much and I still had all those um, <clears throat> expenses, I learned that it cost me about a couple of grand and that didn't even pay me for my time. So when I listed a house, if they ever bought my commission, I'd say, you know what? <clears throat> I'm so sorry, but we know how much every listing costs us. And in order for us to do our marketing plan in such a way that gets you the most money in the shortest amount of time, we have to do those items. And if I were to cut the commission, what that would mean is I couldn't provide the superior level of service that we know it takes to sell those properties. Now, what I will tell you is, Mr. Seller, if an agent is saying that they will cut their commission and I'm competing with that agent, the one thing I'm gonna ask you is if they can't negotiate their own money, how well will they negotiate yours? Second to that, what that tells me is they actually do not know how much it's costing them to provide you service. And most agents don't know, I have no idea. So know your numbers, know what it costs you. 
um, and be willing to start verbalizing that if people asked you to ne negotiate your commission down. So, okay. Any other questions? Before you send us up. Yeah, I'll send it out before I leave if I could get that sign up back. Is anybody in here that didn't sign up? Okay, just pass that around. Y'all were so quiet. Is, is that because I talk too much or with the no questions or with the questions? <laughs> so funny. Darshan. Bless. Bless my heart. <laughs> Bless my heart. So to answer your question, these things are not provided in MLS. These are things that I just learned over the years that I needed the absorption study. I, that actually was covered in a um, listing specialist class I was in one time. Mm -hmm. um, and seemed like it would cover one other place. It's very simple math. Just figure out how many are active, how many have sold per month. I usually go back six months time period mm -hmm. and then figure out the, the supply, you, you know, how many, you have, how much month supply. If you need help with it, you can call me separately. Okay. Or, I mean, if there's a tremendous need of everybody, I mean, we could do a, a CMA absorption study type mm -hmm. training. So it, it, there's a there's an amazing class and it's specific to this market. It's the only class I know of. It's about to pick it. Uh, an old vet kid, uh, Cole, a banker, or something like that, and she does a CMA class specific to this area. And is it Joe, what's that? Joe, is it Man the listing strategic strategic listing reason? Yeah, that's the class of it. Yeah. That is one of the absolute yeah. most comprehensive classes, yeah. so specific that you'll get. Joe Mango, she used to be married to Tom. I don't know if she still is. Tom Mango he used to own that the school, the HBW. That's right. That's exactly yeah. Yeah, I, I took her class. That was probably that took me from I didn't understand comps at all to yeah. oh okay. Well, it, yeah, it's it's actually a designation when you go through the class called strategic listing specialist. And oh by the way, Josh, if you have that, that's something that you need to put on the front page of your list or your pre listing package. Yeah. Um they if you took the class too, you also get a logo you can use with it. To put on your card or business cards. Yeah, I think I've got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, strategic listing specialist is a superb class. Thank you for bringing that up. And it's it's just there's no I, I that's the first one I've ever seen specific to an area. Even though she doesn't, she covers it generally. She really hones in a lot on this area, especially you know during the the heat of like the seller's market, so that you kind of can carry it over. To Right. Yeah. And you need that. That's, you know, a lot of times we go to classes and say, okay, I'm going to go through this class so I can get more business. But if you change your mindset around, okay, I'm going to this class to sharpen my skills to provide my seller a level of service that they can't get anywhere else, that's the key. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, hands down, if you know how to do an absorption study, there's probably only one out of 10 agents that even know how to do it. 
Look, y'all. I I went on a listing a, a few weeks ago. They the people were buying a new house. The on site agent was a general brokerage agent. And he ran numbers on the house and told them what they could get. They called me. Referral from uh, not a past client, but a family friend <laughs> who's on my bail out list. And they, they said, you know what, who, JK, who can we know, who can we trust and know to lead us right? He said, well, you need to call Amanda. That's what you're trying to build, is a reputation of that. They called me. Um, I ran numbers. We got them $50,000 over what the other agent told them they could get. Simply because when I looked at the absorption, I learned there was no, no other option, none. And it wasn't that there weren't comps to support the value, it's because the other agent was only looking in neighborhood. Well, I am so sorry, Mr. Appraiser, but just because two homes haven't sold in this neighborhood over the last 12 months, doesn't mean I'm not gonna try to get the most for my seller. I don't have to use comps in the neighborhood. I use this. My job is to give them the highest price, not appraise it. So then it's the appraiser's burden to tell them that their house is worth $50,000 less and let those sellers and that lender eat him alive. And they're not going to do that. They're going to find comps to support because there are comps to support. So um, the absorption study is more valuable in my eyes than the sold comp. Especially with like a very rapidly changing market, it's, it's, it's much, it's much yes. more accurate than just using six or 12 months of comps. Right, because when you're in an upward moving market, as we said a while ago, if you're pulling comps that were even th closed 30 days ago, the market has already surpassed that. You're telling a seller they're worth what this house sold for 30 days ago, they might be missing out on five or 10 grand already if you're in an upward moving market. Now, here's the secret too. When we experience the shift, you will, as agents, have to shift your conversation and get ahead of the eight ball on advising sellers. When we experience a shift and our market goes from moving up to moving down, then are you going to pull comps from right here? If you pull comps from right here and we're in a downward moving market, you're advising this seller they can get more for their house than they're ever going to get. And guess who's going to look like they don't know what they're doing? You. Because the market has already drifted past what you could get it for, and they're complaining to you. Josh, why'd you tell me I have to get that for my house? I'm not paying that for my house. Why aren't you selling it? You're not doing your job. So when you shift, you have to be prepared as agents to explain the same conversation. I've been on listing appointment after listing appointment. So we're in an upward moving market. You list here, you list there. We're in a downward moving market. <laughs> you know, do the visual for them. But when we're in a downward shift, you need to be saying, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I pulled the comps on your house and you're priced out right here. But if you want to win the competition against all the other sellers right now, you're actually going to have to be a little bit more competitive than right here. My suggestion is to list it right about here so that you're more competitive against all the other sellers on the market. You get the offer first, you're overdone and closed with before they even realize what's going on. And so that, once again, is where you use your absorption study. Because if you pull that absorption study and you see that we're about to exceed a six month supply of homes, you know, as an agent, things are going down. If you're advising sellers, you got six months supply of inventory, you need to be letting them know, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, a year ago, we were pulling absorption studies. We were at less than a month supply of houses. People were writing multiple offers. They were paying over list price. But I got to tell you, in running my absorption studies, there's six months supply of homes right now. And if you're not more competitive in your price and your condition than all those other sellers, we're going to be left, left behind. We need to get ahead of the curve and move a list here so we can get your contract and move on. So we don't get stale dated. Make sense? Okay. All right.
I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And thank you for coming today. Yeah, I saw you here.